details. Ha, huh, there you go. Welcome no, to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. I started... No, don't mute. You were saying something about Echo, Pete. <laughs> All right. So I was... Rec- because Bridget is their expert musician sound person. I watched Echo... And one of the things Echo does is because the main character is deaf, they play with sound. Um, they don't do a lot of speaking, and they do this whole thing that even like even during a fight, they don't hear anything. So you're watching this fight, and it's often starts off silent. Um, is the music silent the as things, well? What's that? Is the soundtrack music silent as well? No, there is situation. there is some there is some music. Um okay. and it's pretty good too, actually. A lot of uh uh Native American music as well, which I really enjoyed. Um but one of the things that all this makes you do is you have to pay attention to the video because you don't have normal sound cues that you would normally get from routine films that say oh yeah something's about to happen you need to watch because they're not there what do you mean aren't you watching already really cool um i kind of multitask yeah and uh yeah you know if something's really boring i'll just listen for the the specific sound cue to pop my head up and they're like oh look i don't know the crescendo of music means there's a monster coming this younger generation <laughs> yes. has to be doing five things no, at I, once. I support this. Creative people, a lot of times we have ten things going on in the background. I get it. Yeah. And he's sneezing now. But yeah, it's in my queue. I need to watch it and then I will, yeah, I will I, give I, you I my report. Really <laughs> well, anyway. let, let me know but, if... But just to further embarrass Pete, I do, now Please that do. I reorganize my bookshelves, I have a little Pete Rollick section on my bookshelf just wanted to what yes. oh i was hoping you were really gonna embarrass pete <laughs> no. actually bridget you need a you need a bobblehead pete <laughs> that would be hilarious oh i want a bobblehead pete yeah hi matt i wasn't sure if you were able to connect or not and i just saw your name there and then you the voice from the ether so, matt well, is breaking the law yes <laughs> He is a podcasting and driving. Can't you um, can't you be the passenger? Can't your wife drive? Uh, I am going. Okay, hey, hey, this is better a topic um, offline, but I'm is. going down to a, a work week. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Well, we. You're right. We do have a guest. I just realized this. Sorry, Pat. Patrick. No worries. Like Pat or Patrick? Uh, Patrick's uh, the usual uh, preference Patrick? there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I keep getting these. It's really cold in here for cold down here. It's cold here for Texas, I should say. And I keep getting these internet unstable messages. So if I glitch out or something, you guys let me know. Or maybe that'll be good for you, and then you don't have to listen to me. It's minus. Yeah, it's minus five here right now. Gross. Wow. This is why I don't live. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't want to say anything, but uh, right it's, now I checked out. It's like seventy there right now. <laughs> It's 67, yeah. heading to 68. Did, did you have to put on a jacket? I did, actually, to walk the dog, because it's actually oh, poor. Oh, 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 poor boy. Patrick, you're in St. Paul, right? Yeah, it's uh, with wind chill here. I said it was like negative 20, so yeah, it, no no good. I'm a, not a fan. That's why I left North Dakota. 55 degrees, I had to put my sweater on. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm from Iowa, and I'm used to the cold but i haven't i haven't felt this cold in a long time we've been down here for like 13 years so yeah my wife was supposed to be in michigan this week but uh they've got like a foot of snow in her hometown and uh they had cancel flights and stuff so she's put it off for about three weeks excuse me well all i can say is you guys yeah are, i would too you guys are damn lucky that True Detective Night Country does not come on until 9 p.m. Eastern tonight. Otherwise, I'd be canceling this. Nine o'clock tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, that's fair. All episodes. That's refreshing. All of them. That's what I. That's what Google told me, and Google wow. is always right, as you know. 
I'm hoping so that's, are we all that's binging it before next weekend so we can talk about uh, it. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, I feel insulted that you would even ask me that, Bridget. Of course we are. <laughs> no. And if the old man can't get them all in, then, you know, whatever. So anyway, yes, we do have a guest, Patrick. Can I announce the prize first? I guess. <laughs> okay, there is a, a picture posted on the uh, Easing Facebook page. It is a copy of a, a collection of four novellas, I think, called Whispers in the Dark. If you want a chance to win, send an email to easingprizes at gmail.com. Just put Whispers in the subject heading. Uh, we're going to draw a winner sometime in February. Just uh, be the winner. I haven't read this, but this uh, you said four... And I thought I saw Cthulhu Mythos stories. Yep. Right. It's, yes. it's a good collection, actually. I really enjoyed it. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Pete Roddick likes it. Uh, does Bobblehead what, Pete like it? Does, <laughs> does German Godzilla Pete like it? That's what I want to know. Yeah, I give it three Mothras. <laughs> three Mothras. <laughs> Well, Patrick. Oh, there you go. Yeah, thanks for it. You've you've seen these episodes before, right? Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I apologize for that. But then, <laughs> oh, I'm 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 ready. Believe me. All right, we're gonna do introductions, and then we're gonna we'll have you introduce yourself, and and we'll talk to you. Uh, Bobblehead Pete, you want to start? I'm Pete Rollick, who uh, apparently needs new spine. <laughs> Um, I write books, I edit stuff, and I watch really bad movies. Pete, and nobody listens to me list? when I tell them that they're really bad movies. No, I listen. That's why I don't watch them. I do listen. And you have a new, you have a new book out on Kindle. It was out in yes. Front. Um, Miskatonic what? University specials. In... Jeez, what's that? You didn't what? know this. My jogging your memory about them. <laughs> I have lots of stuff going on, man. Yeah. See, this is why there's you don't multitask. A, there's even a kid's book coming out. If yes, I ever there get is. The, um, You'll get the proof. I promise. The Mr. Tank University Spirituals and Club is available on Kindle. And if it works out really, really well, maybe we'll do Eldritch Equations as well. Okay. Anna. I just want to recommend that uh, Mir Miskatonic University Spiritualism Club is actually very entertaining. Quite a read. Yes, for those of you who don't, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Matthew Carpenter is in the car driving, but he didn't want to miss the show because it is the highlight of his week. So, so yeah. That uh, guy. We gotta yeah. listen to his GPS. <laughs> You're going the uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. No. You're going the wrong way. You're going to kill someone. Take a left. She's crazy. A left. She's a crazy. Left. She's crazy. Turn how left. does she know where we're going? Yeah, how does she know? Turn Am I the only one who's seen this? <laughs> uh, it was a terrible movie. It had like three laughs in it. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you. Keep it up. Bridget. Oh, hi. <laughs> that was not me. That was Matt's genius. <laughs> Hello, I'm Bridget, musician, artist. Turn <laughs> Troublemaker. Left. Turn left. Okay, Mark. I'm Mark Rainey, uh, editor and writer of many, many scary things. You'll You'll find my work under Stephen Mark Rainey. But my friends and enemies alike tend to call me Mark with varying degrees of disdain. <laughs> and Rick. Hello, you know, buddy. I think Rick froze. I can't hear anybody now. Well, we can hear you, unfortunately. Uh, there he goes. Now right. I can hear. All right, Rick, you want to introduce I yourself? Play, uh, yeah. Writer and, uh... Magazine collector. All right. So any any problems that we're having today is it's Matthew Carpenter's fault. So hey Patrick, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to happy to be here. 
uh, worst case scenario, if my internet proves untrustworthy today, I don't think that's going to happen, but just so let's, we can do it tomorrow night or the next night. So, but I've got my fingers crossed. So, um, yeah, good. so you, you've got a book out. Where did I put it? Yeah. Pre-approved for haunting by Patrick Barb. One. Yep. And this is your first collection. Is that right? It is my my first collection. I've had uh, a couple of novellas and a novelette uh, that were published in 22. Uh, but this is the first sort of, uh, this is my first collection. Uh, this that came out in, uh, on, in September of 23. Um, tell us a little bit about you, for those uh, out there who don't know you yet, and how, how you got into horror, you know, your influences, things like that. And yeah. then let's talk about the book a bit. Absolutely. Um, I am a writer originally from the South, uh, Virginia and Tennessee, and I've kind of lived all over the map. Uh, worked in publishing in New York for seven, seven years, uh, met my wife, and we moved out to uh, Northern California, where I still worked in publishing. And then eventually around 2018, 2019, uh, we had two kids and decided that uh, we wanted to stop living in some of the most expensive places in the United States in order to have a house and raise our kids. So we moved to uh, the Midwest to uh, St. Paul, which is where my wife is from. She's from the Twin Cities. Uh, and around that time, I had the opportunity to kind of take some take some time away from a day job and sort of concentrate on writing. Uh, it's always been something like since I was a kid that I wanted to do. Um, and I'd had like fits and starts, you know, writing, working on comics, working on screenwriting, uh, trying my hand at short stories, but hadn't really put that concentrated effort in uh, until this time when I wasn't going into a day job and wasn't working in the editorial side of things and kind of seeing working with other people's work. I had time to concentrate on my own. So, um, you know, had a chance to really get down to working on short story craft, reading a lot, uh, taking some classes sending stuff out there, just writing and writing and writing and continuing to send stuff out and getting all the rejections you could possibly ask for and then some more. Um, but then finally making some inroads and making some connections and, and sort of getting stuff published and, and seeing things improve just from that kind of iteration of putting that stuff out there and, and you know, sending it out until it's either it keeps getting rejected and then maybe inspiration flashes and you're like, okay, well, now I know how to fix this or I know how to make this a little bit better. Um, and then the pandemic hit, so that allowed me to stay home <laughs> some more, <laughs> yeah, uh, and 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 work on writing a little bit more than maybe was even originally planned. Um, and so that's kind of what's built up. And as far as like horror goes, that's always been a part of my life. It's I'm terrified of so many things, so it makes sense that I love horror. I think I like to I like to be scared, and and there's so much to be scared of. Uh, I was one of those kids who. My school library had those old uh, Crestwood monster books, the orange covers, and the, they were like Dracula and Wolfman and Frankenstein. And that was kind of my first exposure to to those sort of creatures and monsters. And I would check those out and read them and read them and just be obsessed with, with the monsters. <laughs> um, then later on, I got into like in high school, like uh, Stephen King, Clive Barker, uh, those kind of, uh, you know, sort of the line between horror and dark fantasy and reading a lot of that stuff um, and comics as well. And then and eventually moving into like movies and getting more comfortable watching movies. I was the kid who, when the horror movie commercial would come on, I would hide behind the couch because I was like <laughs> afraid of like, even just the jump scares in those were like too much for me. Yeah. Uh, now it's like, I can watch them and enjoy them and have a good time. I watch movies like every, every Friday, I have like a horror movie night. Um, but yeah, it's it's been something that's always been around. And then now kind of from like 18, 19 through today, it's been this concentrated sort of merging of those two uh, paths, like the horror path and the and the writing path together. Hey, Patrick, just so you know, I hold a title as the world's most terrified kid. So don't even think about <laughs> trying to usurp that. Uh oh, Let's say I'm coming for you. <laughs> what were what were some of what what was your first published couple of stories and where were they published uh yeah it's a good question um the first the first very first story i had published was on a, a website that's no longer 
around. It was a, a spine tinglers.co.uk. Um, and I won one of their monthly contests. It was a story called Final Exam Day at Evil Clown College, which I like more for the title than for the actual story itself. That's a great, um, that's a great title. Yeah. Oh, they gave me a hundred bucks. I was like, oh, now I've made it. And then just nothing for about three years um, or more. Uh, then I had a story uh, published in the Across the Universe uh, anthology, which was a sort of alternate reality versions of the Beatles. Um, I did a story about, uh, it was called uh, uh, When I'm Number 64, and it was a play play on Paul McCartney being dead and it was this sort of like he keeps dying and keeps getting resurrected and he can't find a way to kill him so he can't find a way to die um so it was kind of like this sort of like horror existential crisis for for Paul um and that was kind of the first couple of things that I had uh published and then I started to get into more uh markets like uh, there was a magazine that was around for about a year called Boneyard Soup Magazine um that did some really good work paid pro rates and I had a few stories uh, in there, some of which, at least one of which is in the collection. And it just sort of built built from there, just getting things into anthologies, getting things into into web, web, websites. Um, I think I had something in, uh, um, I'm gonna draw a blank on, on what the name of the publication is. Um, That's okay, I kind of put you on the yeah. spot with that. <laughs> no, no, no worries, I should, I should, I, I should try to remember more of these. Um, it's the, the place that does the submission grinder, uh, the, their uh, website. I had a, a story in there uh, recently as well. Um, so yeah, I just try to send stuff out and get stuff out into these places that that I enjoy reading and then trying to get my own stuff in there. Well, and the lesson lesson is always the same, isn't it? No matter what what you're doing, whatever goal you're you're trying to reach, you know, whether you're, you're a writer or or anything else. And it's uh you know don't give up you know keep trying keep doing it yeah i mean absolutely i think for me you know i think sometimes when i was growing up and i had all these people say like oh you're a really great writer because you can like write an essay or you can like tell a story or do or do something like that and i believe that only takes you so far um because there's a lot of people that are hearing that same thing uh, from their parents, from their teachers, what have you, um, hopefully. Um, it, it's, it comes down to, like like you said, just doing more and not being afraid of rejection. Like, I almost feel like now I wish I was more uh, impacted by rejection sometimes. Like it's it's just kind of like, okay, this is, this is happening. This is not the right time for this piece or it's not the right market for this piece. Whatever reason it can be, um, you know, it's it's time to just move on and then write more, send out more, keep keep going. Yeah. Um whatever anyone thinks of of Tony Robbins, I one of his books that I read decades ago talks about the ultimate success formula. And it basically comes out down to um, you know, learning from whatever, you know, just keep your eye on the goal, learn from whatever mistakes you make. And then adjust because you have to remember that and march towards the goal again. So, yeah. So anyway, uh, talk about your, speaking of your stories are great. Talk about the, um, your dedication in the, in the pre-proof for haunting to your parents, oh, yeah. I think. Yes. Yes. Um, so <laughs> like I said, I've always wanted to be a writer. Um, it's just one of those things where I think maybe like kindergarten or first grade, my my father it was a paper salesman and my mom was a uh, elementary school teacher. She especially was focused on uh, reading and developing reading programs for elementary schools. So I like to tell people that it was like faded that I would become a writer because I had like the materials and the content uh, <laughs> pushed on me early. Um, but, you know, once I learned that there were people who came up with the stories, I think something clicked very young for me where it was like, okay, this is more, this is cooler than like the characters in the story. I'd almost rather, I, you know, this is where, this is the cool thing is like the people that write the stories. So uh, I would dictate stories to my father, my, my mom, and they would write down the words for me. This is before I was able to, to write. And I would draw that is pictures. so sweet. 
That is so yeah. nice. Yeah. And she still has them. She keeps these these old like sort of like legal pad, yellow legal pads of like these pictures. And the stories I wrote were not horror. They weren't even speculative in any any fashion. There's a story called The Greens. I still have the, she still has the book, or I may, I may have it at this point. And it's about a family. They go to the zoo and they go to the museum. It's a, it's very 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 late. It's close to come to literary writing. I think I really peaked on that side of things. Uh, very young. How old were um, you that for that one? How old were you? I was probably like six or seven, I think, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, it's, uh, it, you know, stick figures and there's a zoo. And they all sleep in the same bed at the end because, you know, I'm not going to draw like multiple beds. Why why bother with that, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, it's uh, that you had really supportive parents then. So that's, that's awesome. Um, your dedication. Yeah, is yeah for, absolutely. For mom and dad, I've come a long way from stick figure drawings and dictated stories written down on a yellow legal pad, huh? So <laughs> are, are they still with us or are they still around? They are. They are. Yeah. And uh, we just visited them for, for the holidays uh, and, and got to see, you know, they've got copies of the book and everything. And um, they're not horror fans. So, you know, they're like, we're not reading this. <laughs> That's fine. I'm like, That's totally fine. Probably uh, some of the language in some of the places, I'm all good. It's don't worry about it. Uh, is what I told them. Uh, and they were, you know, mom's still holding out hope that I've got like a, a children's book in me or something uh, someday. So we'll, we'll see down the road. Who knows? Well, it happened for Pete, you know, so. Yeah, yeah that's what I heard. Exactly. You. Yeah. Uh, you said that you like to be scared, um, safely scared, like watching movies and reading horror or just scared in general. You know, maybe that's a dumb question, but no, yeah. Well, you know, I got a lot of anxiety. I was one of those kids who, like, you know, it took me a long time to realize, like, oh, I've got like anxiety, anxiety, and so there was a lot of like life. I think for a while that was very scary to me, like crowds and people and and going around and doing these things. And and since then, like, I've taking medication and going to therapy and it's like all these wonderful things that you can do um which means i can focus more on the being scared that i like which is again reading uh stories watching movies uh doing it from a place where um you know there is safety there is an ability yeah. to kind of pull back um my kids are really into like horror games like computer games and things yeah. like that like the five nights at freddy's thing and they're always asking me, well, you like horror, you like books, you like movies. Why do you not like uh, the video games? And I tell them it's because you're taking on the role. You are the person. There's no remove from the situation. And immersive. so it's so immersive that I just I'm like, yeah, your dad loves these things, but I'm not going to play your games. You guys have fun. I don't want anything. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with it. When my son was uh, younger, he played Five Nights at Freddy's and I, I, I played a few times when he was in the room and man, the jump scares mm -hmm. in that game are just off the charts. <laughs> you, know? I don't, you know, he, my, my oldest watched a video that was just every single jump scare in five nights at Freddy's. And it was just a video of things jumping out repeatedly. And yeah, for me, I was like, that's, you know, my poor, my poor heart can't take it, pal. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta ask that you take that in your room or something. Um, you think it's cathartic? Um, watching and reading horror as far as your anxiety uh, real life fears things like that yeah i mean absolutely i feel like there is something it's very um there's very primal about learning about reading about things that are scary or the scary things that happen to other people or are witnessing them i think because there is just um this chance to see it through another people person's eyes to see this experience and to witness it and to know that there is that safety of the screen or the page or whatever is separating you uh from it and so i think that's definitely a big part of it uh a friend and i were talking recently about the difference between reading horror that that truly disturbs you scares you whatever and say because we, we were discussing supernatural buffy angel that sort of thing um you know and that's more like comfort food viewing as opposed mm -hmm. to um 
reading or watching something that actually is disturbing. So, although I I've heard uh, people watching Buffy the 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 silent one with all the monsters coming in to Sunnydale. Oh yeah, what's pretty scary at the time if you were if you were younger. So. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, watching that it. Like I had it recorded or something on my VCR back in the day. It's I think it goes still in the period where I had a VCR to to record stuff, and it was, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, definitely um, had those moments. Same with like X Files. I feel like there's X Files kind of walks that line for me between. Yeah. Sometimes it's genuinely unsettling, and sometimes it's like scary in the fun, in the fun kind of way. Yeah. Um, hey, Patrick, yeah. Ahead, uh, if you don't mind me asking, where in uh, where uh, where in Virginia did you live? I was from uh, Franklin, Virginia, south in the southeast. Okay, yeah, I live in uh, South Central Virginia, so I was just curious. But um, one of the things it, it sounded like you know you've been a lot of places, um, uh, different parts of the country. One of the things I love both writing and reading is fiction. It's got a strong sense of place. And I'm just wondering if any of the different locations you've been uh, in any way uh, influence you or, or tie into what you write. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Cause I think going back to what I was talking about earlier about putting the work in and, and practicing when I was getting serious about the short story writing side of things, I sort of had this feeling that, location and setting were something that I was not landing as well as I would have would have wanted to or would have hoped it would would go so I spent a lot of time focusing on that specifically in my writing and trying to get at that sense of place and trying to pull from these different places uh, that I've been whether it's um, mostly Virginia and then Tennessee my folks moved to Tennessee when I was a junior in high school and I spent a lot of time around that area of like Memphis and I went to school in Mississippi and sort of pulling from like that sort of more deeper South uh, side of things as well. And I think that comes through in a lot of the stories or a lot of the settings. I tend to gravitate more towards the South in terms of setting and and what's happening. Some of the Midwest is starting to creep in. I think in some of my uh, stories, I've got some stories that are set here in in Minnesota. I think it's going to take some time though, to kind of get used to the place we've been here for, I think maybe we were like four or five years now and I'm, I'm getting used to it. It's like just cold, cold, cold. Um, there's always like, it's always a good thing for, for that kind of element. Um, but yeah, I think that's definitely something that I'm mindful of and I try to bring into uh, what I'm writing. That's a Very great cool. question, Mark. Um, and I enjoy it as well. And for the Midwest, Patrick, you know, being from the Midwest myself, it the thing that is always at the forefront of my mind when I think about atmosphere uh, and setting in the Midwest is I think about in Iowa um, in an Iowa winter and it's dusk but the sun hasn't quite set yet but there's all these winter storm clouds and mm-hmm. you, you know um, as uh, was it Elrond in the Lord of the Rings as as nighttime that comes in winter without a star something like that Mm -hmm. and it's cold as hell i think about that in the city and then i think about all these stubbed over cornfields and driving you know mike i i I gotta say and and i'm in rural illinois at the moment it's cornfields and (laughs) it's like absolutely gray white sky and the air has like this almost steel or irony tinge exactly (laughs) exactly exactly what you're describing yeah well i'm i'm watching you you'll never find (laughs) the camera so but yeah yeah thanks thanks matt but you know that that's this 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 mood this setting and exactly what matt just said steel colored skies and um what's the movie i can't think of the movie um where he's taking her to back to the midwest to meet his family oh i'm think i'm thinking of ending things have you guys seen that um mm-hmm. yeah and she says uh yeah. when she passes yeah, one Netflix, of these, uh, yeah. yeah when she passes one of these fields she says um uh, it is beautiful out here in a um you know a uh 
sad or despairing type of way, something like that. But yeah, each each place has its own atmosphere. So you're from New York, yeah, C- I mean, New York City, right? Uh, Virginia. I was in New York for for um, about seven years uh, working in publishing, and so I've had that kind of experience. So, so I thought I'd been through snow with New York and the kind of slush that that it really accumulates very quickly once they clear the they clear the roads so fast there I had no idea what I was getting into compared to to out here where it's just like it's not it's it's a constant presence in that sky uh that I mentioned was definitely it's there for like four months you just don't see the sun really it's through this like haze of white it's white above and white below and you just kind of think that i don't think it's ever going to be green again i don't think that i'll see a leaf on a tree ever again and then all of a sudden it's all back and it's green and lush and 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 hot as hell and you're like well i don't think it's ever going to snow again and then it does and then (laughs) especially this year where we didn't we had snow on halloween um and then we just really it's been late uh, getting snow now we're finally getting it and this is something usually by this time of year we're on our like third or fourth snowstorm and so it's definitely like the the, the change in the climate and the weather is definitely uh being felt here uh with the with the el nino uh system and everything yeah you know, i'm sure this is mike's fault but right now the wind is screaming outside <laughs> the last the last time it is we were here um, we had tornado warnings and sirens going off and everything. We had a tornado touchdown about five miles from here. And today the wind is hollering so bad. I'm really beginning to think that all I have to do is get on with Mike. And that's, you know, it's like into the world times. Wow. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about the stories and pre-approved for haunting. And, oh, and to the audience, I just wanted to say, if I'm a little clipped i apologize um i i think from now on what i'm gonna have to do is just reset the internet before each each session maybe that'll help but it's been a been a problem last couple weeks but usually my internet connection is really fast but for example this this the short story casual um you mentioned uh somewhere i think in here that it's about no, not in here, somewhere else. The uh, Your experience in New York City dating in your 20s. Yes. Yeah. Minus, the, minus the, the killing part of it. Uh, as far as we as know. Far yeah. as, as far as everyone knows, yeah. I think the, uh, you know, <laughs> I, that's, you know, can't say anything more than that. Um, yeah, I mean, I wanted to write a story that was about these kind of like, it's a story about these two people who meet it's around Christmas time in New York, which is always, was always very like fun time for me um, as a young man, kind of living there and seeing the lights and the hustle and bustle and all the sort of cliches that you think about when it, when it comes to Christmas in New York, I was a complete fool for it. Loved it. Um, And wanting to like how these people come together, except rather than uh, go on a date, they're actually two uh, serial killers who are, looking to finally practice their craft uh, together rather than than separately. And so there's this moment that's of this shared intimacy. Um, so drawing from very real experience of like that dating in your 20s in a big city, meeting a lot of different people, trying to find that connection uh, with somebody and finding it to one degree or another, but then knowing maybe, okay, this is a temporary thing. This is not my soulmate. This is not the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with even though I did eventually meet my wife in New York through online dating. And so in that case, it worked out for me. Um, and no lives were, um, no lives were no taken lives were lost. in the process either. So no lives were lost. In fact, we ended, up, we ended up adding to, to the population eventually uh, when we had kids. So, you know, it's a, it's a net positive on that front. Um, <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's really was came, came from, came from that experience and wanting to kind of give it a little uh, like sort of hard twist so to speak yeah and and that's not a spoiler by the way you find out that that the the protagonist is a serial killer in the first sentence or two so yeah if, I, if i'm yeah, that's what I figured. yeah <laughs> I, I, very true yeah and i wanted to kind of get 
right to the point there so there wasn't any sense of like oh is this like a a literary like is this just like a, a romance no it's it's not it's uh it's very much not yeah the talk about a few of your of the other stories in the book as much as you can without spoilers let's start off with um which one's your favorite do you have a favorite there's there's 18 or 19 stories in here i believe yeah it's 18 um it's a mix of i think it's like uh 14 uh reprints and in, in six originals i i want to say or my math's probably off there um that's 20 so whichever way um and it's a mix of flash and it's a mix of sort of longer uh short stories as well um you know i tried in putting the collection together to have these sort of mini themes yeah i mean exactly um <laughs> And in trying to sort of put these uh, into these categories, so there's stories that are focused on like family and horror, and there's stories that are focused on kind of uh, media and depictions of horror in like movies and TV and, and things like that. And then there's a, a third category of like supernatural horror, and then there's a lot of kind of like slashery type of horror with a mix of weirdness uh, to it. And I think as far as like my favorite story it's probably the last one in the collection. It's called uh, the Jalo kid in the cataclysms uh, campground. And it's basically a slasher meets cosmic horror type of story. It is about a brother and sister. Uh, the brother is the slasher and the sister is the final girl. But right before they're about to have their final confrontation, uh, the world ends in this sort of strange, weird cosmic, uh, horror type of way and they're basically stuck in this liminal space campground that they can't seem to escape and it's just the two of them and sometimes people will venture into this space um, and I like this I, I, I really like the idea of playing with kind of common horror tropes or things like or elements that that people are familiar with but then finding my way into them to kind of give it a twist or make it something different while still keeping some of the elements that people are are familiar with but just adding to it and enhancing it and taking it beyond the usual yeah i read somewhere else that you you basically said i love uh tropes i love cliches and then you put you know you put your twist on them um serial killers what are, what are some of your favorite cliches and tropes obviously yeah, serial I mean, killers <laughs> Serial killers, ghost, a um, haunted house. Uh, the, the the title story for the collection is kind of a, t a take on the sort of haunted house um, and the sort of paranormal investigator. Pre-approved for haunting is a story about a man who is a uh, he's a paranormal investigator and he keeps getting called back to this same house over the course of its existence, from the time it's being built to kind of like the final owners that are covered in the story and every time the owners are convinced that they are there's a haunting going on but everything that he's seeing points to it not being anything from the past that is haunting uh this house um so i think like the, i don't want to get too much into spoilers but like that time there is a, definitely a big yeah. part of that and and thinking I about how we can be haunted by potential by what's to come a lot of times more than we can be haunted by what's happened uh before Ooh, by contrast what are some tropes that you're sick of or that you can't stand good question yeah well you know i've never been and i, I think my writing i i'll have plenty of gore i'll have violence i'll have things like that i'm not um somebody who is big into like the like sexualized violence or things like that and obviously i'm not into it yeah you know, like it's just doesn't something that i don't think i can do well in a way that is respectful in a way that is kind of balanced um and so for me having that be the impetus for horror having that be the motivation for characters i mean i feel like it's been done so much and anybody that's going to do it well is probably already done it a lot of times um and so it's it's like i feel like you're going back to the well one too many times that's just not a well that i'm i'm willing to to tap into uh, personally 
the there's a story that you might like um you, you may know this if you're been listening to the show but i'm a huge fan of old time radio uh-huh. uh, there's um there was a very successful show called suspense in uh-huh. the 40s and i think early 50s and their i would say their most their best story is called the house in cypress canyon and you can listen to this on youtube or whatever just just google it but it's I, I I don't want to spoil anything, but just from you having written pre-approved for haunting, I think mm-hmm. that you would like listen to me this, and it's only about 25, 30 minutes. So, yeah, check. You'll have to check it out and let me know what you think if if yeah, you want to. So I will I I will definitely do that. I listen to a lot of um, the same like old timey horror um, radio oh, programs. So I got the pod- podcast I listen to that does those. Um, yeah, I love it. It's a good, it's kind of my like nighttime routine right before bed, like listen to something scary. Like I said, it's as long as it's not happening to me, totally fine. Totally right. help me go to sleep. No problem. <laughs> uh, you, this is an audio book also, folks. And you've got a lot of different narrators here. Uh, mm-hmm. You want to talk about that a little bit? Usually you don't see that a lot unless it's maybe someone like Stephen King or, you know, like that he most of the time audiobooks you'll see one narrator or maybe two if there's a you know female stories in there as well female protagonists excuse me um how did that come about and yeah you know i i wish i had more details for it um i basically consider myself pretty lucky that they were able to assemble the sort of diverse uh past and, and sort of have this, these many different uh, narrative voices, like to, to, to sort of read the different stories. Narrators um, assemble. The, yeah, exactly. My, <laughs> my publisher, um, Keylight Turner Publishing, they uh, sold the, the audio rights to, I think Dreamscape is who did, does the audio book. And they've done a few, they've also done a few audio books uh, with Turner, I believe. And Really, I guess you know it, the, they they made that decision on their end, um, and so I'm happy they did it. Um, it it's been it's been really cool to to sort of hear uh, some of the other stories and dip into them and hear hear them from different voices. I think um, I've had a few stories that were originally published in audio. Um, things that were published on like the Tales to Terrify uh, podcast, and it's always fun. I think to hear a a different voice. Um, you know, have like a specific narrator who's reading it and doing the different voices and and bringing these things to life. Um, there's, there, there, there's an added dimension there. You know, it's there. an added dimension. Yeah. You can sometimes it's uh, you know a lot of times it's great and you hear the story and you're like, oh, it sounds great. It's like I'm hearing it anew. Other times you're like, ah, that is not. They stumbled over that sentence that I stumbled over myself and I thought I can get away with this and no you, you can't sometimes when you hear other people <laughs> reading it you know that it's just not happening well uh, to the audience I really did enjoy reading this this collection um, in fact I emailed Patrick when and when I was in the middle of reading it and told him that I just I really loved it um, and I also uh, thank you for sending me the the book but I, I, I also used a credit and got it on Audible. And I've been enjoying um, listening to that version of the book as well. So Oh, it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, Much appreciate it. I was very happy to get that email. Oh, yeah. I've you. been into audiobooks a lot lately because my eyes don't hold up like they used to. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely check yours out. Oh, I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's great that you had all those different narrators. Um, that, that's a wonderful thing. The uh, talk about coffee, you know, you've got you. I, I saw in a couple of interviews where you're just uh, really into getting that coffee and writing the horror. Still there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I am I am I yeah, breaking I'm up here. again? Can you hear me? Yeah. I know, I was thinking about I was, uh, just a little bit. Um, yeah, I was uh, I was I was thinking about coffee. Sorry, that's why I was uh, oh. out there for a little bit. Um, you know, it's it's a part of. I feel like at this point, it's a part of my process. Um, I 
one of my first jobs was working at uh, Starbucks. Um, I was a barista and, um, you know, I got used to drinking a lot of coffee, just black coffee all the time. And so like, that is my thing is like, I will have a cup of coffee or two or four in the, in the morning and just write like early afternoon, my writing schedule, I try to keep it as regular as possible because I, that's the way I found that I'm able to get the work done to like get things done and get things sent out is if I write every day at the same time and I, I write on the weekdays I write um like just before lunch just before the kids get home from school and then uh, a little bit at night after after we put them to bed and just doing those three they're doing those three sessions usually about two because like my evening session has trended more towards um, like the logistic part of writing, the sending stuff out, the checking submissions and right. that kind of thing. Um, so really it's just about, you know, I do it for about 30 minutes through the sort of Pomodoro, uh, method of like 25, 30 minutes sessions. So it's really about an hour. Um, so I work, I write about five hours, uh, a week. So I only write on the weekdays and the weekends. I sort of, that's the kind of compromise I made with my, my family is like, okay, have this time to write during the week weekends are family time with the exception of the the lovely people of the lovecraft easy podcast <laughs> um trust me after you know they, i've been home a lot with the kids so they we all need a break from them anyway so we all need a break from each other so it's all good <laughs> uh the richard thomas wrote the um oh but when i was going to ask you pomodoro first of all the, do you mm -hmm. find that that works really well for you it does. I think yeah. just in terms of getting in and getting out, my sort of the way the individual writing sessions for me work are I will go back over the previous writing sessions work only. I won't go farther back than that. And then I kind of do that and then relay, take the take the baton, write the next part. And that's sort of how I write and iterate these things and how um, eventually when I'm done, the draft is not finished finished but it's cleaner than it would be if it was just a straight no looking back right. writing all the way the way through um and For then just in terms of like work stuff it also helps because i do i have yeah. a day job now that i work i work from home so it just that it helps strike that balance between work writing family keeping the house clean relatively for those who are not familiar with pomodoro can you give us a short explanation of how it works because it yeah. I, I found it to be very useful at times mm -hmm. uh, basically it's a, a way of working where you set a timer for 25 minutes do a task then there's five minute break and then 25 minutes on the next task five minute break uh and i think the way that it's supposed to work is you do it four times and there's supposed to be like a longer break in between um I don't have the luxury of that extra hour. So I tend to just like go through doing these 25 minute bursts with five minute breaks yeah. uh, in between most, yeah. most days. That, that might've been, that's one of the main idea way, ways that they present it, but I don't think there's a wrong way to do it. As long as you're, you're getting things done. There's uh, for those mm -hmm. who are interested in this, obviously you can always Google it, but there are actually apps that you can get where it'll do the 25 minutes for you and then alert you say it's time for a five minute break and so forth. But the really neat thing about the best Pomodoro apps is it keeps track of the, how much you've gotten done, not just today, but all previous days and so forth. And you get this feeling of accomplishment from it. So, you know, it, it can be very helpful. So if those, those of you who have, struggle with, you know, uh, sitting down, put your butt in the chair, whether you're a writer or, or whoever you are, it can be very handy. So, so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Richard Thomas wrote the, inter wrote the preface, excuse me, to your book. Can you talk about that a bit? Yeah. Um, Richard is somebody who I consider one of my like primary mentors when it comes to like fiction, short, short story writing. Um, he, when I was kind of getting back into horror and getting back into 
are short fiction, I was listening to a lot of podcasts and I, I had heard him uh, interviewed a couple of places and talking about some of the, the classes that he teaches. Uh, and I finally had that, that moment where I had time to, to work on my craft and to work on writing. I reached out to to Richard and took his uh, short story writing class, which then led to his um, sort of dark fiction class, which led to his advanced uh, creative writing class. And all these times just developing more stories. And, and many of the stories that are in the collection were either um, written in his class or were kind of the inspiration came from maybe exercises that were done uh, yeah. in his class. I actually just finished uh, taking his uh, novel in a year class. So Richard has a sort of full spectrum of classes. He's and he's always been somebody who's been very supportive of my writing. Um, you know, he published uh, his latest collection, Spontaneous Human Combustion, with with Turner with Keylight Books. And when I was looking, you know, I had sort of amassed this collection of of stories and and that I felt were good uh, enough to be published again in a, in a format where there's a, a cover and, <laughs> and many stories <laughs> together. Um, and he, he connected me with his editor um, there at the time and, you know, I put together a pitch and, and I, like I said, I worked in publishing before I worked at uh, Penguin Random House for one of their, their imprints. Um, and I, sort of seen I've been on the other side of the table so to speak right I've seen like pitches and I've seen like proposals and things like that so I kind of had a sense of how it needed to look and what the words needed to be to kind of sell the story and mm -hmm. as a matter of fact a lot of the copy the advertising copy things that are on Barnes and Noble or Amazon even the copy that's in the back of the book or in the the flaps depending on what kind of version you have that's all from my proposal that's all from the things I sent them so you know I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy they included it. Um, and, and Richard's been there kind of throughout this process of, of sort of supporting and pointing me to the right people and, and sharing things. And so I was very happy to kind of have his um, voice um, and, and sort of his appreciation of craft and the stories themselves. I think that his forward really goes into a lot of meat of the of the stories and yeah. so I, I i love that part of it when i when i have guests on this podcast uh it's it's always because hey this is a really cool person or they've they've created something that i really like be it a book or whatever or or both and you know not only as um look read this book you really enjoy it that sort of thing and and folks you really you will but as a blueprint for look this person's doing it right you know he's putting his butt in the chair he's he's got a work ethic and richard thomas talks about that we had him on a while back i can't remember how far yeah. back but yeah he says uh, in the preface one of the things i've always admired about patrick going back some four years now is his worth it work ethic he puts his butt in the chair, did the heavy lifting, and didn't complain. Those are the best students, and I found usually the best authors because they understand it's not easy to write short stories. Uh, Patrick returned his, returned his work on time, embraced each assignment, and really worked hard to make the most out of every opportunity. So, yeah, it's, it's, not, just, it's not just talent. It's um, this, this quality of, of not giving up. And doing the work, you know. Yeah, although I, I think if if it was my wife writing the uh, forward, the the part about no complaining would have uh, probably <laughs> been uh, stricken from the from the record. Um, right. You know, that's my. I feel like that's part of my like principles list honor roll uh, student thing coming back there is like just wanting to like get the work done. I, I for me, it's like I hate to leave things undone. Like I hate to see things that are not finished. And so for me writing these stories like i want to see how these things end like if it's something that i've come up with or like you know i want to um get it done um and then kind of like get it out get it out there and share it with other people it's really that's exciting for me and, and a fun part of wh what we do yeah um keith you've talked about this before are you still there yeah i'm still here You've talked about this before me? and how, yeah, and how important it is to, to, to meet deadlines, to uh, get the work done on time and so forth. 
Yeah, and I, and I come at this from two different directions. You know, as as when I when I'm editing books, and I've only done it a couple times, and I keep swearing I'm never going to do it again. You know, when you do that open call, and you it's like I'm looking for Cthulhu Mythos stories, right? I don't know how many werewolf stories I got, <laughs> or you know this or that you know, ghost stories, you know, and I hear this from editors all the time. It's like, people just send you slush that doesn't fit the call. Yeah. And I, and I don't understand this because what I do is I make a note of it. I send it out to all my friends and say, Hey, you know, this, all, all my, the other editors that I know. And I say, this guy's, you know, literally, blitzing my inbox with garbage i'm never going to read anything by them again and i'm going to suggest you never do either but then i come from the writing side of it and i don't know how many times i i will i will tell you that and you make fun of me mike because i have this huge productivity thing oh, like, i'm not making you fun of you I, that's just a tease because i really i honestly do admire it if you give me a deadline, I will make that deadline. And editors know this. So I routinely get a phone call on like Thursday night, Friday morning and say, that says, I need 8,000 words by Monday on this subject. And it doesn't have to be good. It's just that we have a hole because somebody didn't produce. And, you know, the, the editor needs to fill that hole otherwise the book doesn't go to press and they're sh because they're, they're short so you know there's a story i don't know who who it was but somebody was late on delivering their novel and they said oh, well I'll, I'll finish it in six months and they're they're um their rep was like well you know who's your who's your publisher and they said so and so it's so like yeah who do you think is going to publish your next book right you know the threat being you know if you don't deliver they're not going to work with you again and it, it's a good point you know you have to sit when you make a promise to a publisher or an editor you got to sit your butt in the chair and you got to produce word um, gets around or or, or word gets around um, you know, and the only people who get a pass on this are like people who are really, really talented. Um, like John Langan or, you know, Paul Tremblay, who like can be three, four months late. And, uh, the editor will tolerate that. No one's going to talk. No one's going to tolerate it if it's your first or third. Right submission or story or, exactly. or novel or whatever yeah so no it's like and so patrick is 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 dead on the money when like he's talking about you know putting the butt in the chair doing the work and getting kudos for that it doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal but for i will tell you for a lot of people it is a lot of people can't make that deadline I, and I, I sold three stories this year alone because other people couldn't make the deadline. And I'll admit they weren't good stories, but they were stories that were finished and complete. And on topic, you know, you can write the world's greatest werewolf story, but if I'm asking for vampire stories, right. what's the point? Mm. I I would, I do tease you, but I would disagree that they're not good because you do write good stuff, Pete. Mm. What was the, uh... What was that movie recently in the last year or two? It was called Scary Movie. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Where the 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 couple um a man movie? and a woman are in a cabin and they're Tell telling me something you, scary or yeah. something like that. Uh, yeah. What scare was me. It? Scare, scare me. me. Yeah. yeah. Uh scare me. Right. Well there's a the, there's a scene there where you know, he's talking to her about her success, and later on, she's like, "I'm, I, I've become successful because I do the work." You know, so yeah, I, I dug that movie a lot. I think 
not as far as there's some scary parts in it, but I think just in terms of talking about the the nature of storytelling and and telling uh, scary stories, I thought it really hit hit a lot of the notes right on the on the head there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's a story. One of your your short stories in pre-approved for haunting is called "I Will Not Read Your Haunted Script." Um, will you talk a little bit about that one? And it it, it breaks the fourth wall. Um, or it's very meta, however you want to phrase it. You know. Yeah, um, that story uh, was originally written for a a contest, and it was sort of a horror in Hollywood. A contest I ended up getting second place so I was very happy with how that one uh, worked out and it's basically uh, about this the inspiration came from years ago um, I think it made like the village voice or one of those publications uh, screenwriter Josh Olson um, had a column an essay called like I will not read your uh, effing script and and it was like basically saying like I'm a, I'm a writer I'm not going to read your script um, because there's all these complications, the reasons why it's very funny. It's very, um, uh, it's a very good piece. Uh, and I sort of took that and said, okay, but what if it was a haunted script? What if there was something supernatural tied to the script in the movie? And so it's about this, uh, guy who's a screenwriter and this person comes and they want them, they want this writer to read their script, which they also claim is haunted. And as the story goes on, there's elements of kind of the screen the screenplay format that that comes into play, and the sort of blending, uh, blurring of realities um, from this sort of like haunted, potentially haunted uh, screenplay. And that was a fun one. I like I said before, when I was trying to find my way as a writer and trying to find out what I was going to do, screenwriting was one of the things that I, I looked at and I entered contests and wrote some scripts and, and did that sort of thing. Um, and it's still, it's still it's something I'm interested in. Um, but it's not, not where my focus is now. My focus is more on the, on the prose side of things, but it was a lot of fun to kind of take those elements that I'd learned and add them into the, into the story and sort of have that kind of combo uh, of elements. I, re I really enjoy um, the fourth wall stories movies whatever when they're done well and, and this was done really well i really enjoyed it um i liked I it a lot question? please what uh, patrick what uh, horror movie when you were growing up or t tv show got into horror well like i said i think the a lot of the universal monsters were kind of my first gateway into it and then um I wasn't into a lot of like the slasher stuff. Now I'm obsessed with it. I love it all. Um, but for me, I think the thing that made me more comfortable watching quote unquote scary things was like probably the X-Files, um, you know, watching it on Friday nights or Sunday nights, um, depending on what, what time of, the, of the, the show's run it was. Those were when I, I had those sort of hour, 45 minute burst of scariness. Um, you know, I still think about that episode, uh, Home, the one that's kind oh, of like God, a, yeah. a Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre like style one. And that one still was just so scary. Um, that was probably my gateway into it. And then getting more into things like um, the John Carpenter kind of stuff later on um, in the, you know, when I was in college and things like that, that kind of Halloween, um, all those things went on from there. I was just telling my wife last night that the the best way to watch X Files is in the dark, you know. So, mm -hmm. um, as far as I, I, I'd like for you to check this out when you get time too, if you don't mind. There's a it's on Kindle Unlimited, but it's called uh, Strange Little Horrors. I've talked about this before a year or two back. Uh, it's by okay writer by the name of Amy Cross. Mm. Uh, it's available in print as well. But specifically, there's a short story in there, and it's called Sitcom. And mm. it does this better than any story, I think, that I've ever seen, or at least in the top three to five. So um, if, if you do read it, let me know what you think. 
yeah so. absolutely and then no don't ever apologize for recommendations i like <laughs> i love it i have so many books uh, that i've you know my my tbr is just going to eventually topple over and, and crush me um but i just like to have you know i like to hear from other people and, and that's sort of i think how i've improved my own sort of writing is just from like seeing things from the past like you go i feel like it's got to radiate from both ways it's got to be like things from the past that that people recommend and people that i admire recommend and then those people who are coming up and the next generation kind of thing i think a lot of times it's that oh you really need to read this person they're they're new and i will grab it from either direction really well um that goes for the audience too if you guys check this out um comment on the youtube um in the youtube comments and let me know let me know what you think um let's see here now my now my google is talking to me i don't know what it's saying um what yeah, you mentioned. I, okay, I read an interview that you did, and you talked about Scream as being one of your first slasher movies yes. that scared you. Yes, that's first of all, it makes me feel really old. But yeah, well, talk yeah, about that. sorry. Um, <laughs> I like I said, I was very terrified of like that sort of like modern at the time modern horror you know i was like the kid who just hated like chucky and leprechaun and all those like little anything like little people or like sort of small things attacking you just not a fan whatsoever um and i was at the beach uh with a friend and this was kind of a i was in high school i think um so i'm not not that old uh (laughs) or that young i guess um and it was like a third run one of those third run beach um theaters where it's like sands in the seats and there's like sand in the aisles it's like the perfect way to watch something like that i feel like and i went and saw it and it was like the little the light went off right it's like this sort of like oh this is clever and they're talking there it has that meta element to it and i think that has carried through in my own work uh, to 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 one degree or another um but it still manages to be scary. I think that first scream has some real moments that are unsettling and that are sort of like creepy and, and, yeah. and frightening. Um, and having, and once that happened, it was like, okay, I'm, I've, I've watched it. I've been scared, but I'm still here. Nothing's happened. Um, and it was like <laughs> the floodgates opened up and I was like getting, getting, getting movies and, and getting the VHSs at first. And then, you know, when the DVD uh, sort of boom hit, um, one of the people I worked with at, at Starbucks was actually a big horror buff and he wanted to get rid of his collection of DVDs because he had sort of had this sort of like change of heart and didn't want to have horror. No, so he just gave it all to me. It was great. I just had all these movies and it was like, well, you know what? Your loss is my gain. This is a exactly. sort of crash course education. And really that's what helps when it comes to like embracing this media is just, getting as much as you can, watching as much as you can, reading as much as you can, and finding out what you like. I think watching a lot of stuff and reading a lot of stuff has helped me sort of define my own taste and to know, A, what I enjoy reading or watching, but also what I enjoy uh, writing, you know, it, it's which it can be different. Yeah. It's like what do you like to read and what you like to watch can be different than what you um, like, to, like to write. Well, thanks for what you There's said. A, about... a... Yeah, go ahead, Pete. Sorry. Oh, there's a there's a quote from um, the science fiction writer um, Mike Resnick, um, who says uh, that he writes in his universe, but he would like to live in James White's universe. Mm-hmm. Um, James White was a Irish author who wrote a lot of really positive, upbeat science fiction <laughs> uh, set on a place called Hospital Station, where basically everything could be solved by because it was a medical problem. Um, but Mike Resnick wrote all these like sort of assassins and, and, and cowboys in space novels. Um, but he really wanted to live in, in James White's and it's, it, but it's, it, it goes to your point. It's, there are, there are things that you want to write and there are things where you would rather live in. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, just I've lost my train of thought, but, but well, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead if you... No, I, the other thing I was going to say is that um, my kids, who are in their mid-teens, 
are now buying CDs and DVDs secondhand because from what I understand, this is what they tell me, Generation Alpha does not want to be tied to Netflix and any of these streaming services because they're pulling the plug on all these shows that they love. Mm. Yeah. And they yeah. Can't watch what they want to watch when yeah. it's available. You know, like I guess it was uh, two weeks ago, Paramount took all of its Star Trek movies off of Paramount Plus. It's Paramount. You got to have Star Trek there for I, God's they're, sake. They're, well, they're they're all become orange. like Disney where they release a DVD 10 years later, you know? Yes. Keep it in the yeah, vault. And then it'll... Right. Now, I found them. They're on Showtime Max. Mm. Mm. But Good what was the point of buying Paramount if you're not going to watch Star Trek? You know? Yeah. So yeah. literally yeah. kids. you know. I stopped it too, as a matter of fact. 10 years ago, it was everybody was buying vinyl again. Now kids are buying CDs and DVDs again. Yeah, I've seen it. I mean, I, I've just recently I got because um, they were on Netflix and then they're on Paramount, the, the Twilight Zone. I got the whole Twilight Zone right. on Blu-ray and I also got Night Gallery um, as well. Sure. I was like, well, I, I want to have these things because, you know, some, they, they bounce around so much and then sometimes right. they take it away. There was even this uh, rumor they squashed it, but they were saying that Max or HBO, Warner Brothers was going to get rid of Looney Tunes being on the, the streaming. And they were like, right. if you can't sell Looney, if you can't sell Bugs Bunny to to people, I don't like maybe you shouldn't be doing it then. Yeah. It's really yeah. then you have uh, then you have um, uh, Prime telling us that we're going to have commercials now. Yep. There's, I think Max has commercials on some format. It's basically just like, I'm just like, we're just paying extra for cable yeah. at this point. Again, it's all sort of circled back. I, I, you know, I trimmed mine way down. I, I, I wouldn't actually not have kept prime if it wasn't for that. I save money on, on shipping and I get things faster, you yeah. know? Um, but yeah, I don't have Netflix anymore. I think we, we've got Hulu and Prime, and I, I've got Discovery because I really like all the astronomy um, documentaries there, but that's pretty much it. Yeah. What, Pete? Astrology or astronomy? Astronomy. Astrology or astronomy. astronomy. All right. The other thing that I'm going to tell you is that like, I'm really jealous of Patrick because I had to grow up with 30 to 40 years of bad slasher films before uh -huh. someone started making meta slasher films. <laughs> um. See, but I love the bad ones now. Like that's my whole thing. Is like I'm watching a ton of Tubi all the time. Like I've I got Shutter. Yeah. Shutter for me, like Shutter is like your your like really smart friends collection <laughs> that they like share with you. But Tubi is just like the mom and pop video store that I grew up in. With like just like you just browse through the posters and you're like, well, that seems weird. Spider baby. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So like I, I, I love them. The the bat the worst. Like I've seen some ones that are just like. Whew, like you just like 16 millimeter sort of like you see the scratch marks all over the print you're like this oh, is sure. probably something that's maybe a cursed film at this point um yeah the whole legend I, of bobby I, creek stuff and yeah, oh yeah that one i watched the i watched this uh three on a meat hook the other day um <laughs> that one is just what? oh boy it's yeah. uh it's this old it was this very very old um so it's kind of like psycho but yeah. for this sort of grind house type of, of film um very poorly acted uh, like soap opera actors from new york from like the 70s or something like that it's uh it's something let me tell you well have you seen streak of the mutilated oh, no oh my no God. i haven't I've, I've heard of it though oh it's hilariously bad I yeah bet. and now i know it is because <laughs> we watched it the bronze yeah we did a mystery science theater 3000 type thing for oh, the patrons fantastic so, so patrons if you want want us to do another one let me know or if it's no. not your thing that's fine no, no, too no. no yeah yes no <laughs> the book is called pre-approved for haunting by patrick barb b-a-r-b and it's available in print and kindle it's available uh, in audio book format and um we've got a few more things to talk about patrick you're welcome to stay if you'd like yeah, absolutely. All right. Happy to. Is everyone still join. hearing me okay for the most part? Yeah, and I've got some Hi. breaking news. Yes, go ahead. 
So I don't know how many people heard, but last month, David Drake died. Um, now it's just been released that Walter DeBill died. Um, Texas writer, uh, um, most famous for his story, uh, Where Yudra Walks. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, he just, he passed away, uh, December 16th. His daughter's just now telling everybody. Mm. Well, very, very, uh, sad. We're, we've lost a couple more writers. Yeah. Um, in the genre. So, um, something new uh, the lovecraft easing has a public calendar now and you can access it by going to the lovecraft easing website can you just and... sync that up with my calendar yeah you can all you do is, is no, I would, no 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 let's not do that because that's <laughs> just yeah well if you if you go to the 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 podcast uh, page on the lovecraft easing website then you can it i've, I've linked to it there and you can get the uh, it'll take you to the the google calendar a couple things is that whatever time zone it shows you is depending on your browser or your um your phone or whatever you're using but if you click the add to calendar it'll convert it to your time zone and the other thing is if you click this on the sunday podcast shows i've got the the guests for the next three months or so um, with their details on there so that's the best way now to to see who's going to be on the show and um, yeah let me know folks how you like it and as always uh, YouTube comments really help the show for the algorithm and if you yeah what oh, I, I just wanted to go back to Walter DeVille only had a second yeah one one second let me finish this um what the hell was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, YouTube comments. Let, let us let me know what you think uh, of the calendar. Let me know what you think of the uh, Amy Cross short story in Strange Little Horrors called Sitcom. And of course, most of all, um, let us know what you think of of Patrick's book, Pre Approved for Haunting. I think everyone's going to enjoy, enjoy it a lot. Um, Matt. Okay, so just Pete mentioned Walter DeBille, and I. I wonder how many modern readers have heard of him because he was like, his stories were coming out in the seventies and eighties back in the old pastiche era. Mm -hmm. And if I don't miss my guess, I think his only collection, Pete, you could correct me was um, Lair of the dreamer. I think from mythos books, right? No, uh, the, the black one. sutra. Yeah. The black sutra. Was it mythos books? Um, who published this piece of, or was it uh, Hippocampus? It was with those books. But he also yeah, had so the problem. Yeah, number the... one. He Which had one? The, uh, the Lanthos cycle, which, which is a collection of almost all his missing stories. Did that ever come out? It's a, it's available in Kindle. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Or in PDF, or somehow, I I had a copy of it. All right. Well, well, the thing is, it's because his book came out through those books. Smith, those books went under in like 2009. Yeah. You know, his stories have just not been out there. Yeah. And, and I don't I, think he published I anything. I seem to recall he had a really good story. He had a good story called The Bookseller's Second Wife. Do you remember that one? Yeah. Yes. I think that was him. Yeah. Uh, so he wrote. <clears throat> He wrote some very entertaining stories, but a lot of it was pastiche. Uh, I will uh, post a note up on the uh, Facebook group, Mike. Okay, wait till you park to do that. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> uh, all right, so um, yeah, yeah, Patrick. One of the the biggest complaint complaint and quotes that we get about this show is that we add to people's TBRs. So, you know, I'll take it. Um, Bridget, you told me before you were a panelist, you'd be like going down the road, listening to the podcast and having to pull over and write one down. <laughs> so, or just remember. So when I got home, I'd have to write them all down really quick. Yeah. 
Well, uh, here, it, speaking of that, here's another couple of recommendations I have for you. First of all, for those of you who have not read this, uh, Blackwater, the book of fantastic literature edited by Alberto Manguel. There are, uh, uh, I'll, I'll admit I missed this when it came out. It came out in the 80s, but there are a lot of really wonderful stories in here. And it's a door, it's a door stopper, but it's only available in print, but I highly recommend it. And then the other one, other book I wanted to recommend is called uh, Drive Shaft. It's available print and Kindle. And um, it's uh, it's a it's it's sort of a um, cursed films kind of book, which I, I'm compiling a list of those. Uh, I need to find my own list, but I'm definitely going to add this one to it. Um, and I don't know, it's just really good. It's about uh, I should have had this pulled up. Give me one second. Michael Butler drive shaft. Okay, so when a mysterious cult horror movie from the 70s pops up on YouTube, Ben simply has to see it. He has to see it partly because it's a horror film, but mostly because it stars Margot Kidder. Ben asks his girlfriend, Lena, to watch it with him. She does. Drive Shaft, however, is no ordinary film, and before they know it, Ben and Lena are trapped within its murky and disturbing world. Luckily, they meet fellow drive shaft victims, Frank and Catherine. The four decide that the only way to rid themselves of, of the drive shaft curse is through, wait for it, exorcism. But I'm really enjoying it. So, and uh, um, yeah, I think Matt had the list. I've lost the list, but I'm going to be posting a list of, of books about cursed films, strange films, that sort of thing. Um, Paul Trimbley is about to come out with one. Uh, it's just called it's it's called horror movie. So I think that's out in the summer. I don't remember the exact date, but um, but yeah, I think you can go ahead and pre-order that horror horror movie Trimbley. Yeah, you can pre-order it. Um, a chilling twist on the cursed film genre. From best-selling author The Paul Bearers Club and The Cabin at the End of the World. In June 93, a group of young guerrilla filmmakers spend four weeks making horror movie, a notorious, disturbing art house horror flick. The weird part, only three of the film scenes were ever released to the public, but horror movie has nevertheless grown a rabid fan base. Three decades later, Hollywood is pushing for a big budget reboot and i won't i won't read the rest of it but it's by paul trembley so it's bound to be good um yeah i think that's all i had as far as recommendations all right so who's watching true detective night country tonight great just me <laughs> oh, Mike, Mike, I gotta wait. Till I'm, I gotta wait till I'm home and I can watch it with Isabel. Yeah, she's not really into that stuff, is she? Well, this is True Detective. She loves. She's like True Detective. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it's Jodie Foster, and Jodie Foster usually she's usually great. picks. Yeah, she picks winners. So, um, did you guys see that that um, YouTube? Um, preview that I sent to you earlier today. Oh, Lord, we get to hear. <laughs> turn left. Yeah, turn left. You're we going the wrong way. Yes, I did see that. Uh, as a parent, I'm terrified. As a horror person, I'm like, yeah, I'll see what happens. Yeah, maybe that's the one that was the uh, Oz Perkins directed film i think so yeah i mean, I, I loved his, i've loved his stuff that i've seen like the he did the black coat's daughter and he did the gretel and hansel um which i thought was really creepy and, and well made i'm still not sure i understand black coat's daughter but that's okay <laughs> I, I 
I think he does a good job with the atmosphere. And so that these these two trailer these two teasers have been like yeah. all atmosphere kind of thing. And yes. and well, apparently they, they, they don't even say which movie it is. No, unless you can read those weird symbols at the end. Right. They those are really um good trailers. You know, the weird re- symbols remind me of the Zodiac for some reason. Yeah. Like Zodiac Killer. Yeah. What, Pete? I'm trying to... Was it... Uh, what was that show post-X-Files um, with Walter, Walter in it? Um, Jose Chung? FBI... No, it was the FBI researching weird events with this scientist who had been blackballed. Fringe? Fringe. Oh, yeah. So if you remember, every episode of Fringe ended with some weird symbols. Right. And all that stuff actually meant something. Yeah. I I think also, um, what was the one set on the island did the same thing. Um, Lost? Lost. But yeah, I. Anyway. Yeah, the when when Fringe came out, it was on network TV every week. You had uh, people just going to town trying to figure out what it meant, and they yeah. they broke the code, I think, pretty quickly. I think they did. Yeah. Well, um, I'm going to link to this in the show notes on bloody disgusting, but the the it's two movie previews, and they say that their best guess is that it's Long Legs, a hotly anticipated serial killer for a movie from director Osgood Perkins, as Patrick mentioned. So, but th- that's pretty, those are chilling previews. I like them a lot. So, did you catch, did you catch the last episode of uh, Monarch? No, not yet. Well, you'll like it. They set up the second season very well. Okay. Awesome. Um, so, Mike, on uh, movie night, we ended up watching Unwelcome. Yeah, I was going to ask you, yeah. because I, I heard that everybody liked it. Yeah, it's it's the kind of thing where like, Patrick wouldn't like it. It's about little people. But, <laughs> uh, no, no thanks. But uh, it's one of those things where it's like, it's like eating a um, delicious bowl of uh, panna cotta <laughs> or something like that. Very tasty, enjoyable. No substance, doesn't leave anything with you. Hmm. <clears throat> so you just enjoy it as the experience of watching it because it was just uh, it's interesting. Okay, so this family, the most scary parts are when people are assaulting other people so this young couple the girl just got pregnant um they get attacked in their uh flat in england and his great aunt dies and leaves him a house in uh ireland and uh, when they're moving into the house the neighbor is suggesting there's a gate at the end of the garden and they have to leave an offering every day of something bloody so if they, they have to leave, it's not like leaving a bowl of milk or sweets for the fairies. It's They're supposed to leave bloody raw liver every day. Otherwise, there may be a price to be paid. What is liver? Like $5 for 10 pounds? You get through a whole month for that, right? Yeah, well, I mean, okay, that's assuming that, oh, you actually believe in the little people. Oh, ho, ho. <laughs> yeah. You know, th- things happen. It's it's. I, it was very enjoyable, especially for a crowd. You know, I, I really have to admire the dedication of Matt showing up for the show while he's driving. You know, so. Was it sort of like Arthur Mackin's ghost stories? Sorry? I see Matt, was it sort of like Arthur Mackin's short stories about the little people? Uh, not, no, it, it, it. I think I've seen a preview that, for this. It's not got that same sense of the fantastic. It ends up seeing much more visceral, uh, more mundane, more real than something fantastical. 
I didn't mm. get a match and feel at all. Mm. Okay. Um, the Bronzo was going to talk about Aquaman Andromeda, but he's not here today, so we'll talk about that next week. Uh, sometimes I doubt his commitment to sparkle motion. You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. My kids even know that quote. Good, good. They've seen Donnie Darko. They should. Yeah. Okay. No, they just know that quote. <laughs> oh. Anything else to talk about? I, I really, I'm sorry for my internet connection today, guys. Patrick, sorry about that. No, no worries. I got, I, I heard the questions. They all, they all came through. <laughs> so, you know. All right. Made it work. Got something. Yes. But if you're a Doctor Who fan on YouTube, there is a 10-minute skit in which the Muppets of Pigs, Pigs in Space make the Daniel Tennant Doctor. <laughs> Very well. That's excellent. Is this recent? It was done. They did it around the time Jodie Whittaker took over Doctor Who. Because there's a reference to that in the skit. Okay. It's on YouTube, you said? Yeah, you, you probably put in YouTube, Doctor Who, Muppets. Yeah. Now, there are two versions of the skit. One is one was with Daniel Tennant, and one was with uh, his father-in-law Peter Davidson, who was an earlier Doctor Who. And there's really no difference between them, except they just tailored to some of the dialogue to fit uh, the particular Doctor. But you probably want to see the Dan Daniel Tennant one. It's it's kind of funny how that worked out, right? Mm -hmm. Peter Davidson is a Doctor, and his son-in-law is a, a Doctor. Doctor Who, I mean, <laughs> and, and his uh, his his daughter, who's married to David Tennant, played David Tennant's daughter on Doctor yep. Who. Right. Yeah. Make it even more confusing. Right. Who was also a doctor. Yeah. She the was. I don't remember that. Wasn't she like the cross sex clone or something like that? That's what he's talking they, they, about. They, they, they created yeah. DNA. Yeah. The way they did it was there was there was this. Uh, Two nations that were going, that were locked in a, a civil war, and uh, they took DNA off of uh, anyone they captured, and they would uh, roll that person into an adult soldier. Right. You know, I keep forgetting to ask you this, Rick. But before we close, I want to ask it in in the classic Doctor Who episodes the the first doctor he has a granddaughter is that right because i've not yes. seen all of these yes he does so what's the story on that does she just disappear or is she really his granddaughter or he was his, he apparently was his, the way he left it she was his granddaughter and she runs off uh with a earth man marries him around the time the daleks first invaded earth Who's her, who are our parents? We have no idea. Okay. Hmm. All right. Anything else, guys? No. If if you're not a patron, for me. Yeah, if you're not a patron, I hope you'll consider it. Um, I'm about to release either tonight or tomorrow. Um, our recent Patreon podcast recording with Sandy Peterson. Um, I think everybody knows who he is, but if you don't, he created the, the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, um, Cthulhu Wars, and and so forth. So it was it was a really fun conversation, and you can access this at the at the very bottom level. And there are a lot of other, which is five dollars a month, and there are a lot of others as well. You know, interviews with people like Laird Barron. Paul Trimley and Nadia Bolkin and I discuss Lake Mungo and just tons more. So, so I hope you'll check it out because the patrons are who keeps um, the podcast going. And I really appreciate you guys. Um, all right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thanks for watching again. I'll, 
apologize for my internet connection and um i think hopefully it'll be better next week thanks let's see here stop recording